And now I'm excited to introduce Dr. James Schilling. James D. Schilling is the George Ruff Professor in Real Estate Studies at DePaul University, where he has taught since 2007. Prior moving to DePaul, Dr. Schilling also taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Cambridge University, and Louisiana State University. He regularly lectures on topics of private equity real estate investment and teaches real estate finance and investments. Dr. Schilling has published numerous papers on housing and real estate investments, trends that impact home buyers, investors, and the real estate industry. His most recent work has focused on the economics of private equity real estate funds and methods to estimate risk and return on private equity real estate funds. Dr. Schilling is a past editor of Real Estate Economics and a past president of the American Real Estate and Urban Economics Association, as well as past president of the Asian Real Estate Society. Dr. Schilling has been honored by a number of prestigious organizations, including receiving the George Bloom Award from the Real Estate and Urban Economics Association and the David Ricardo Medal from the American Real Estate Society. Currently, Dr. Schilling is a faculty member of the Weimar School of Advanced Studies in Real Estate and Land Economics and a co-editor of the Journal of Real Estate Finance and Economics. So without further ado, I will turn it over. Thanks, Emily. All right, so uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, the subject matter for today is the future of cities. And we're going to focus uh, specifically on Chicago, but this talk applies to the future of cities in general uh, in the US. And here's what I'd like to do today. We, I'd like to just focus on the big picture for, for a little bit. I'd like to talk first, just as background, how cities have enabled us in the US to do some amazing things. Second, I want to turn to the demons that all cities face, uh, namely negative externalities. Then I wanna look at some lessons from past pandemics and then get into the nitty gritty here in terms of what happened uh, in Chicago in 2020 and what's in store for us in the future. And then the big takeaway for this talk is that the future is all about consumer cities. So I'll try to explain what that means at the end of the talk, but the key takeaway is that Chicago needs to reinvent itself as a consumer city. And we'll talk specifically about what that means towards the end of our talk. Okay, so let's, let's jump into this. Let's first look at some of the positive features of cities. So in the pre-COVID world, the major positive feature of cities has been all about agglomeration benefits. So all the benefits, at least in the past, all the benefits of cities have come historically and ultimately from doing three things, reducing transport costs for goods, reducing transport costs for people, and reducing transport costs for ideas, knowledge, spillover benefits. And what that means for cities has been in large cities, you see these agglomeration benefits that lead to a positive relationship between density and economic input, output, I should say. And that's what you're seeing in this very first slide. So in this very first slide, we're seeing where economic output is concentrated in the US graphically. And what we see here is that these benefits really are associated in places where there's huge clusters of companies, huge clusters of companies, i.e. the large cities uh, in the US. And you can see Chicago on the map and the economic output for Chicago. But you could see that this is a true statement for uh, for the US. And what I want to convince you is that this is just not a US story. If you look at economic output for the entire globe, you'll see this, you'll see a very similar story. You'll see a very similar story where the benefits have led to a positive relationship between city size and economic output. 
as urban economists or urban economists like to refer to this as agglomeration benefits. So just the major reason why we have cities is because of these agglomeration benefits, at least in the past, right? At least in the past. Okay, second point. When you look at cities, again, historically, at least in the past, cities have led to higher growth rates. So large cities have been associated with higher growth rates. And we could see, you know, at least in the uh, historically, right, we could see a huge spurt in growth for Chicago in the late, in the mid 1800s, I should say. We see, you know, spurts for, you know, growth uh, in Seattle in the late 1800s. We see a spurt in growth in LA in the early 1900s and a spurt in growth for Phoenix in the mid 1900s. And all of that is really reflecting the fact that the fast growing cities first included all of those that were industrializing rapidly. So it gets back to our principle that we said earlier that ultimately the benefits of cities come from three sources. It comes from the reduced transport costs for goods, the reduced transport costs for people, and the reduced transport costs of sharing ideas. So historically, it was all about industrialization and industrializing, and we see these huge spurts in growth for cities in the US. And if you look at the growth rate for cities more recent, right, more recent, what you're gonna see is that the past five years have been difficult years for cities, not only for Chicago. So you could see Chicago on, on this chart here, right? So not only has it been a difficult year for uh, Chicago, but we've seen a roller coaster pattern in growth rates in the last decade for most cities in the US. So we see, you know, um, a pattern of, of, of um, negative growth rates for New York, slowing growth rates in Los Angeles, you know, negative growth rates, population loss, i.e., for Chicago, and population loss for, you know, San Jose. And it's really been a period in which we've seen some um, disenchantment with large cities over the last five years. So we've seen, at least leading up to COVID, that we've been on this roller coaster in terms of growth patterns over the last five years. So it's not all been a story about positive uh, population growth, at least late, as of late, right? It's not all been a positive story. There's been some troubles, troublesome aspect with cities uh, leading into you know, 2020 and leading into the COVID pandemic. Okay, next point um, I wanna to touch on briefly is about prices in cities, house prices in cities. And, and what this, Uh, graph shows, what this graph shows is that over the last 20 years, we've seen huge price increases in urban cities across the U.S. So this is an average for the entire U.S. This is the house price growth by distance from the center of the city, from the CBD. What we see here is that there's been over the last 20 years or so, we've seen huge price increases in the urban city, and we've seen that the price increases have been much higher than on the, or, than on the urban core. So we see much, we see positive price changes in the urban core as on, in, on the fringe, right, of the urban city. But we see price changes being much higher in the, on the urban core. And one of the things I wanted to um, ha take, have you take away from this slide is the fact that 
when you view this city, at least over the past several decades, the inner city has been a place of pleasure, right? It's been the place where people have, have migrated to because of all of the amenities, because of the parks, because of the museums, because of the nightlife, because of the restaurants. Uh, you know, in, in our case, because of you know the the lake access to the lake. So it's been a place of pleasure. I'm going to come back to that towards the end of the talk, right? To explain why we've seen such huge price increases in housing in the urban core rather than on the urban fringe. And so we'll come back to that in a second. So there's been this great pro city tilt over the last 20 years. And you know, one of the questions that you might be thinking about is, is that likely to continue in a post-COVID world? And we'll try to address those questions towards the end. All right, how about, um, so the next two slides here, I'm gonna talk about agglomeration economies in cities for some of the poorer countries. So this is a story about agglomerations for cities that apply to all cities in the world, right? It applies to all cities in the world, particularly to cities in some of the poorer countries of the world, some of the poorer countries in the world. And the chart you're looking at on, on this slide is a chart that shows us the share of countries that are over one third urbanized by GDP output per capita, GDP output per capita. And we're looking at it in 1960, that's the blue bars, and we're looking at it in 2010, that's the red bars. And you know what this World Bank data shows us and suggests to us is one simple fact, right? And we can easily remember this simple fact. And the simple fact is that in the poorest countries, if you can see my cursor here, in the poorest countries with the lowest GDP per capita in the 1960s, the share of those countries, and we're talking about countries like India, uh, Rwanda, um, Malai, um, so that we're talking about some of the poorest countries in the world. In the 1960s, the share of those countries that were more than one third urbanized was zero. So the number's easy to remember, right? So then, so it was zero. And you could see the trend that's taken place in some of the poorer countries, right? That we're seeing a huge shift now towards urbanization and towards cities in some of the poorest countries, some of the poorest countries. This slide, um, this is my second slide on agglomeration economies in, in, in poorer countries. What this slide shows us is that we've seen a large increase in megacities. We've seen a large increase in megacities, and we've seen this increase in megacities primarily in taking place in Asia, in China, and in, in, in Asia in general. So this this chart shows, it's a little complicated to read, but this chart shows us the largest cities in 1950, that's in the table. Then in the black circles are the largest cities in 2000. So taking a look at New York, for example, New York was the sixth largest, it's the largest city in the US, but it was the sixth largest city globally in 2000. The red circles with the numbers uh, in the red circles show us the largest cities in 2018, so as of late. So we could see that the largest city in the world today is Tokyo, up for number three in 2000. This, the, um, the second largest city in the world is uh, in India, uh, in, in uh, Delhi. Um, and so you could see the rise in cities, right? You could see the rise in cities in some of, in Asia in general, in China, in Delhi, and in some of the poorest countries in the world, some of the poorest countries in the world. And, what, and 
What I want to focus on real quickly here is just um, maybe one or two key takeaways. And, and the question becomes, why is this happening, right? And what we see in some of the poorest countries in the world, we see an urban rural happiness gap. This is data again that comes from the World Bank, but we see us from survey data on happiness, we see a huge gap in the urban rural happiness measure in some of the poorest countries. People in those countries continue to leave rural areas and shift to urban areas because life is making them happier. Life is making them happier. And you know, a simple question is, will that shift likely to continue in a post-COVID world, or is it likely to be deferred by COVID? Probably not, right? The gap is so big in some of the poor countries in the world that we'd likely to see this shift continue from rural to urban and it's likely to be undeterred by COVID. And the question is a little bit different for some of the richest countries in the world. And we'll come back to that in a second. So let, that question's slightly different for some of the richest uh, countries in the world. All right. How, um, so the question here again is some of the amazing things that cities have done for us in the past. And the question becomes, how much value creation has there been in cities? And the answer is that it's been a lot. And a key takeaway here in this, in this slide is that Chicago has been a value creating city. It's different from some of the superstar cities, the, mainly the tech hubs in San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, um, San Diego, Minneapolis, Washington, DC, or Boston. So Chicago is different from those cities. The average value creation in those cities, as measured by the stock prices of locally headquartered firms in those cities, scaled by their assets, a ratio above one means that the, the value created is positive. And we see huge, at the high end of this distribution, we see a huge amount of value creation in some of these superstar cities uh, in the US. When we get to Chicago, what's interesting about Chicago, we're in the middle of this distribution. And we're in uh, this distribution, we're in with the likes of Atlanta, Dallas, New York, Philadelphia, and Phoenix. And our average value creation has resulted in a stock price for locally scaled uh, for locally headquartered firms scaled by assets of being about a 1.8 and what's different from the superstar cities is that this cluster in the middle is a fairly well diversified city because we've got a large cluster of cities uh, or, or firms in at, in Chicago, Atlanta, New York, Philadelphia, and Phoenix that are not simply all tech firms. They're, they run the gambit across different segments, right? They run the gambit across different segments. So they're well, it's a, well, it's a fairly well diversified cluster of firms in this middle distribution, all with a, what we would call the Tobin's Q, the ratio of stock price divided by um, assets of about 1.8. So we're below where we, where, we, where we see the superstar cities being, but we're above the low end of the distribution. We're above the low end of the distribution. And at the lowest end of this distribution, we see cities like Cleveland, Charlotte, Richmond, Hartford, Milwaukee, Houston, and Pittsburgh. And I would characterize those as cities that were formerly manufacturing hubs mainly in the Midwest and the Northeast. And some key takeaways, right? So when we talk about places like Chicago, we've got 110 headquartered firms here in, in Chicago that, that, you know, we're, that create this well-diversified um, 
cluster of firms in Chicago. And most of this value creation seems to be about attracting the creative class. It seems to be about having a highly educated workforce that creates economic rent that leads to this value creation, leads to this value creation, at least historically. And to get back to our definition that we said earlier, right, that the benefits of cities ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, ultimately come from one or three things. It either comes from a reduction in transport cost of goods, reduction in transport cost of people, or the reduction in transport cost of ideas. What we're talking about here is that as of maybe the last several decades, most of the agglomeration benefits and the value creation for these locally headquartered firms have come about because of the low transport cost of ideas, the low transport cost of ideas, i.e. knowledge spillover benefits. Right? Firms are more valuable, at least historically, when they cluster in dense urban areas because of these knowledge spillover benefits. All right, um, issue number two here. So those were the amazing, some of the amazing things that cities have allowed us to achieve, at least historically. Now, there are demons associated with cities. There are demons associated with cities. And um, urban economists like to call those demons negative externalities. They like to call those demons negative externalities. And firms in value creating cities that we just looked at have experienced two sorts of negative externalities. One is huge increases in wage rates that reduce the value creation for firms. And second, a huge increase in rents, a huge, huge increases in rents. So we ultimately see that the increases in wages and just the attractiveness of cities have, have made cities more attractive that leads to increases in rents. And it creates some significant problems for some cities, uh, for many cities in the US and globally as well. And it leads to the problem of urban housing affordability. And I don't know if you could see this or not on this chart, if this is gonna show up all this well, but here is Chicago with respect to changes in the median house price. So Chicago is above the trend line in terms of average value creation. And we're fairly at the low end of the spectrum in terms of median changes in house prices. So we're much different. The big takeaway here is that we're much different from San Francisco. Huge increases in wages, huge increases in rents, huge increases in prices. We're much different from Washington, DC. We're much different from San Jose. Uh, and we're much different from Los Angeles and San Diego and from some of the other major tech superstar cities or technology hubs across the US. With respect to the wages, again, you could see that uh, Chicago, this, it's hard to see on this graph, but Chicago is right about here in, in, in this chart. So again, we see Chicago being above the trend. So there's a above increase in value added for Chicago. And we see that in terms of wage increases, we're below wage increases we see in Seattle, Washington, DC, San Francisco, Seattle, and other places. So a couple of, of takeaways here, right? A couple of takeaways here. So ultimately, as we've seen this increases in rents, it leads to affordability problems, housing affordability problems for major cities across the US. Ultimately, it's a supply problem, right? So ultimately it's a supply problem with the lack of building, but an increase in wages that causes another negative externality for most cities, which is this issue of gentrification. And we see both of those issues in Chicago. We see 
a general issue of housing affordability, not as worse as we see in San Francisco and other places, but it is here. And we see issues associated with gentrification. We see issues with gentrification. So we see with cities and with density that there are these negative externalities, negative externalities in terms of house prices, negative next externalities in terms of gentrification. And one that I don't have on this on this slide is we see negative next externalities in terms of in terms of crime, in terms of crime. Okay, let's move on to lessons from past pandemics, right? And here's an interesting example, right? So this is just one pandemic. We're gonna don't have time to go th through other examples, but this is a lesson from one pandemic that's that's interesting. And the pandemic that we're going to look at is the 1918 to 1919 influenza pandemic. So the first takeaway is that pandemics are not new to cities and they're not new to urban areas. This 1918-1919 influenza pandemic that came on the heels of World War One affected 500 million in, infected, I should say, infected 500 million people in the world. That was about a third of the population in the early 1900s. And it caused 2.9 million deaths worldwide and uh, close to 675 million I said that wrong. So there's 50 million deaths worldwide in this pandemic, 50 million deaths worldwide in this pandemic in 1918 and 1919, with, with 675 million deaths in the US. And what I what I was was got conf, what it got mixed up or reversed is if you compare that to the COVID, right? If you compare that to the COVID pandemic. What we see today is that there's been 133, as of today, from the John Hopkins data, there's 133 million people that have been infected, 2.9 million worldwide deaths, and 559,000 deaths in the US. And that's a sobering thought, right? That's a sobering thought. So roughly about the same number, or we're talking about the same number of deaths from the COVID, as we saw in the 1918-1919 uh, influenza pandemic that affected the world. And it came in three waves. It came in the spring of 1918, the autumn of 1918, and then the winter of 1980, 1918, and 1919. And in some places, it you know, still lingered and influenced you, the influence was felt in the 1920s as well. Research suggests that this pandemic emerged first in China. And you could see that um, here's a, just a picture from the Atlantic of policemen standing in the streets of Seattle wearing protective masks. Here's another picture of workers wearing masks on their faces in a Red Cross room again, from the Atlantic. And here's the big takeaway, right? Here's the big takeaway. If we look at urban growth rates for a rural and urban population over the period 1880 to 1950, you're, you're going to see on this chart big blips during the pandemic, the 1918 pandemic. So we're going to see huge blips, right? So we're at the end of World War I, the war to end all wars. There were 117,000 deaths in, in the US from World War I, 53,000 from combat, the rest were from disease, and including the pandemic. The pandemic itself, as we mentioned, took the lives of 675,000 individuals in the US. And that had a huge impact on not only urban growth rates in the US, but also rural growth rates in the US. And so we saw those things drop significantly. 
And, you know, the upshot, though, is that growth rates, at least during that time period, recovered soon after, that they recovered soon after. And I liken this to the fact that you can't stop supply and demand. And in the, 19, in the late 1800s, early 1990s, what was taking place was industrialization. Things that we showed or that I showed you earlier, right? Some amazing things that cities brought for us um, in the in our history, right? And again, it gets back to our our major theme here is that ultimately agglomerations in cities ultimately come from three one of three sources through the reduced transport cost of goods, reduced transport cost of people and the reduced transport cost of ideas. And all of those things were in play. All three of those things were in play in big ways in the early history of, of our country, right? So lessons from past pandemics, if you look at this, it might suggest, well, maybe, right? Maybe the same thing will happen in this pandemic that shortly after COVID, right? Shortly after COVID, life returns back to normal, right? Life returns back to normal. That's one scenario that, you know, you can't discount. One scenario that we can't discount. Okay. We're, um, so uh, theme number four here, right? So we, we talked about what have cities managed to do for us in the past? What are some of the demons associated with, with, uh, with cities and density. What are some of the lessons from past pandemics, right? So maybe if past is prologue, things revert back to normal fairly quickly going forward. And now let's turn to, to look at what happened in 2020 and what's ahead for us, right? What's ahead for Chicago and what's ahead for most cities in the U.S. going forward. So here's a couple of so I've got six slides on this in terms of what happened in 2020, right? So let's just kind of walk through these things real quickly. So if you look at the overall economy for the U.S., what, you're, what you would have seen going into COVID is that we were, the economy was in the longest expansion in our history. So we had the longest expansion from June 2009 to February 2020 in US history, bar none. But yet, you know, the surprising thing over that time period is that everything felt a bit sluggish. The average growth rate in GDP over that time period was slower than in past expansions. We generally moderated towards a long term growth rate about two to two and a half percent in real GDP growth. And then there were other symptoms of moderating growth, right? We saw persistently low interest rates and we saw uh, persistently weak inflation rates over that entire time period. So we were, we were in this right before we got into COVID, right? We were in amidst the longest expansion in our history. Now, there were concerns, right? So th these concerns come from a survey that the DePaul Real Estate Center has been doing over the past three years. And there were some major concerns, you know, that people had for Chicago and in the U.S. leading into uh, 2020 and leading into the COVID pandemic. And the, and the concerns were that the bears were back in force, right? Not the Chicago bears, but just bears were back in force back and forth in most markets, including the Chicago market. And most people you know, were, were describing themselves as cautiously optimistic in terms of what would likely happen in 2020. Most people didn't see a free fall in sight. Most people were cautiously optimistic. Most people mentioned as the most significant threat facing investors, <coughs> excuse me, facing investors in Chicago was Cook County property taxes. And the interesting thing is that 
property tax increases for commercial and industrial properties and just the, the Cook County budgets and the budget for the taxes in, in the city of Chicago itself been an issue for the last three years, been in, been a major issue for investors over the past three years. And it's a significant issue going forward too, right? So it's not going to go away anytime soon. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Now let's uh, turn our attentions um, as we try to wrap up our talk here. Let's turn our attention to what um, took place in terms of the recovery. So most markets in the U.S. experienced a V-shaped recovery. Here in for the U.S., we saw um, as of today, we see about uh, the uh, consumer spending being about 5.5% higher in January uh, today, in March 14, 2020, than in January 2020, right? So we see March 14, 2021, Consumer spending for the U.S. being much higher, 5.5% higher than it was in 2020. So you can see for Chicago, we haven't had the same fee-shaped recovery, but the pattern looks the same, right? So you know, for Chicago, I'll explain that in a second. For Chicago, we've seen consumer spending still lagging where we were in 2020, about four and a half percent below where we were in 2020. And most of that's coming largely from a reduction in spending from high wage earners. Here's a percent change in employment for Chicago. And again, we see somewhat of a V-shaped recovery, but leveling off, right? Leveling off. And it's interesting that it levels off significantly for all of Chicago, but for high wage earners in Chicago, we see a huge increase in employment activity. So high wage increase, high wage earners have actually seen an increase in employment opportunities in Chicago, 2% increase in employment opportunities relative to January 2020, whereas the entire market is still down 7.6%, meaning that the low wage in individuals working at small businesses in Chicago have been adversely affected. And it's a true statement for most affluent areas across the country. And again, we'll come back to explain why that displacement among the low wage earners have taken has taken place over time. Here's a a chart that I love that just shows the percent change in all consumer spending for Chicago. And we broke it down by healthcare, restaurants, and entertainment. And I think the results on this slide are pretty intuitive. And what we see is that spending for healthcare is still down below where it was in 2020. We're 11% below where we were in January 2020. Spending for restaurants and hotels is 34% below where it was uh, in January 2020, and spending for entertainment and recreation is down 54% in Chicago today relative to where it was in uh, January 2020. And all of that's coming from a reduction in high income consumer spending. And it's not because they haven't saved money, they, they saved a ton of money over that time period, but I think it's simply out of concerns about COVID, out of concerns about COVID. One last point about, uh, this is I think my last slide about the impact over this time period. The highest rent zip codes, including affluent areas like Chicago have seen a significant and persistent decrease in small business revenues, small business revenues. So we could see for Chicago, as of today, we're still 30% below in small business revenues where we were in January, 2020. So it's a significant decrease, right? Significant decrease. And these decreases are larger and more affluent area areas than in less affluent areas. And to balance their books, 
small businesses have no choice but to reduce payrolls, which explains some of the persistent trends that we've seen in uh, declines in employment activities in places like Chicago and other high, high uh, influent areas. All right, so we're coming close to the end of our talk and I, I've got four more slides to go through and we're gonna uh, wrap up talking about the future being all about consumer cities. So there are two um, really important questions we wanna get to, but first here's some implications, some takeaways, right? So given this V-shaped recovery, given the, all the savings that have taken place by high wage earners, and the fact that with the vaccine rollout, it were, Chicago should be disproportionately benefited, in 2020, we should see economic growth accelerate. And we're probably, estimates are, we should see economic growth reach about four and a half, real GDP growth for the US reach about four and a half percent. And there's gonna be several positives for the market. High income households have built up a lot of savings. That means a tremendous increase in savings on all the things or spending on all the things that we just talked about. It means positive things for the housing market. The low interest rates are positive for funding, positive for housing market. You recall we have attractive pricing in Chicago relative to a lot of the major metropolitan areas or high priced uh, metro areas. So that's a positive for Chicago. But at the same time, there are some negative things. And the pandemic's likely to exacerbate some trends and reverse others. And it may be that we'll see a shift to more affordable areas. So let's look at two questions to wrap up and then this, this big takeaway. So the first question is this, what if COVID persists, right? So what if COVID persists or we see a new pandemic appear, right? The, the UK strain. So what's likely to happen? Not much is likely to happen if you think back to our, our story about poorer countries. Not much is likely to happen to urban areas in poorer countries. But it's likely that for rich cities, you know, cities, urban areas in, in richer countries, the risk remains large, right? The risk remains large, right? So Nick, wealthier nations need to take extraordinary steps to ensure that this risk of this new pandemic doesn't, doesn't, doesn't occur. That's the first takeaway. Second big question is this. Over time, we've seen incomes rise. As incomes rise, quality of life becomes increasingly important determinant of where somebody wants to, to locate. And it makes it extremely important for cities to attract these high knowledge, high income knowledge base workers, to attract those workers, it means that cities need to become attractive places to live. So if in this new world, if workers, if knowledge-based workers can work from almost anywhere on any device, the biggest question that's facing us, that's different from past pandemics, the biggest question that's facing us is, why not live somewhere you find pleasant, right? Because Going forward in this knowledge-based workers where you can work from almost anywhere, it's not really about lowering transport cost of ideas, but because we can lower those through Zoom, through Google Meet, through almost any device that you want to talk about. So that leads to the final slide, and we're almost uh, right on time here, right? So it leads to this final slide, and this is the wrap-up. Uh, and this is the big takeaway. So when we look at where cities are added and we look at the housing prices in cities, we generally see in most cities that there's this downward sloping rent curve in all cities. This is for a typical city in the US. It happens for Chicago, it happens for San Francisco, New York, it happens for all cities. 
the likely effect of having this new technology and workers being able to work from almost anywhere on any device means that what we're likely to see is a flattening of this bid rent curve, lowering of prices potentially in the urban core and an increase in prices on the urban fringe, more urban sprawl. And it has some significant implications for cities. And this is the ultimately the final slide here. And the implication as we stated earlier is as follows. It's a simple implication. And the implication is cities will need to become consumer cities. Cities will need to be consumer cities. If cities need to become attractive places, right? If they need to become attractive places for workers, the question then becomes what's the role of government in the cities going forward? What will make a city a consumer city? Now you could add your own list of, you know, your own factors to this list, but there are four that I want to focus on. So what makes a city a consumer city? First, cities that are consumer cities offer a variety of services and consumer goods. Cities with more restaurants, live performance have grown quicker in the past because they've been pleasant places to live. They've been consumer cities. Rents in those cities have risen, suggesting it's the quality of life that has gone up. What also makes for consumer cities? Well, they're attractive cities. Physical attributes matter. Architectural beauty matters. Those physical attributes make life more pleasant. Third thing, they're good public services. Good schools, less crime are all linked with strong urban growth. Schools and low crime rate in particular appear to be extremely important in attracting the highly educated, knowledgeable workforce. And then the fourth and final thing on this list is all about decreased commuting times, decreased commuting times. Been extremely important in the past. So transportation patterns been extremely important in the past for, for making cities consumer cities. And again, you might want to add some more factors to this list, but the point is we're in a new economic environment. If workers can work from anywhere on virtually any device, why not work at some place you find pleasant? And the big takeaway for the city of Chicago is we need to focus on what makes us an attractive place for workers and makes us a city that will be a consumer city competing for these attractive, these highly educated, highly mobile workforce in the future. So those are my ideas, guys. I'm going to stop there and open it up for Q&A. Thanks very much. Awesome. Well, I know I certainly found that fascinating. Um, and I'm so appreciative of, of you taking the time to lead this webinar. We do have two great questions to get started off with. OK. Dive in. And again, I'll just reiterate, if anybody has additional questions, feel free to submit them using the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, so first, um, to kick things off, um, this person writes, New York Times published an article today that describes declining office occupancy rates that haven't been seen in a generation yeah. um, to what you were speaking to. Do you think these properties could successfully convert to residential uses or might there be less demand for living in cities more generally? Great question, right? So, you know, it gets at the heart of what we're talking about, right? It gets at this heart. So it gets at this notion that uh, there's a there's been a recent survey by the National Bureau of, of of Business Economists that suggests that households going forward in the U.S. would like to work as much as two to three days from home in a post-COVID environment, and that has huge implications for office markets in urban areas. So if, if you don't need to be 
in close proximity for this knowledge spillover to occur, you can easily work from home. So that means that office firms will start to figure this out, that they could save on rents by relocating to satellite cities or relocating where their highly educated workforce will want to locate. So we're starting to see some of that already take place where we're seeing New York firms locating to Miami and Florida, right? So, so it's, the, it's this notion that we're starting to see some of this come into fruition. And then the question becomes, what do you do with all that leftover space, right? What do you do with that leftover space? And you know, in Chicago, the amount of vacant space in the market today will fill the Willis Tower. So, so that's where we are right now in terms of vacancies in the office market. And the question, what, what do you do with that space? What do you do with that space? And I like to suggest that maybe it gets converted to affordable housing because it's the pressing need that we're seeing in this pandemic because we're seeing job losses in the urban retail service sector. That represents about 20% of the employment workforce for the US. And, and that means increased housing affordability problems in most urban areas throughout the US. And the pressing need then is for how do you address these, uh, this affordable housing concern and maybe you know, this you know, going forward, we'll see some conversion to affordable housing. That would be my response to that question. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is um, just more of a clarifying question. Um, this person asks, could you clarify something? When you say cities, do you mean just within the city limits? Or are you including the entire metropolitan area? Um, for example, when you say Chicago, do you mean the city yeah. of Chicago? Are you including um, companies and populations in the larger metropolitan area? And would you also include the suburbs? An easy example I'm thinking of would be like McDonald's. What, yeah, good question, good question. So. This gets at, at this question of what is a city? So it's a, it's a spot on kind of question, right? So, um, and the definition that most people have when, we, when you do a talk like this is the broader definition. So for Chicago, when you ask what is a city, it would start from Kenosha and it would go down um, to Elgin and, and it would go you know, into you know, maybe as far, you know, into uh, Michigan City and in Indiana, right? So it's the broader base definition. And, you know, we've seen in the city, we'll see sprawl take place. That's, that's kind of the point, right? Is that we'll, we'll, we'll see workers maybe not relocating from Chicago to Phoenix as much, but maybe relocating to the to, uh, suburban core and interestingly enough, I don't know if we have a question on this, but interestingly enough, that's exactly where you're starting to see the hot housing markets take place, right? And we're seeing people on the urban fringe paying as much as 50,000 in excess of listing price just to get their bids accepted in today's market. And much of that comes from the work at home, people wanting to expand their space and get more space. And where do you go to get more space? You go on the urban fringe where prices are lower to consume more housing services. And the market is rampant right now. Definitely. We haven't gotten a question yet on that, but <laughs> my, my personal yeah. question. Um, the next question is about the value cluster rankings. This person asks, where does Los Angeles rank, high, medium, or low? Um, and why did Houston land so low in, in the category? And he also asks, was that because it's a Sunbelt city or does it rely too heavily on oil and gas? Um, those are all great questions, right? Those are all great questions. So, you know, if you, if you go back to this value creation, right? So first, it's a function of what, sit, what firms, where firms locate. And what we, what we, you know, I didn't bring a slide on that, but I could, I could 
I could have shown you a slide showing that there's some unique clusters of, of, of companies and firms in the US and there's some natural kinds of clustering that takes place. And as I tried to indicate for Chicago, our cluster is a fairly diverse cluster. And that diversity means that we're in some tech sectors, but we're also in some, you know, agricultural sectors as well. And so there's this broad range. And that creates the, the when you average out for the 110 firms in Chicago, you get an average value added about 1.8. And, and so then you look at some others, I can't remember all the cities that, that we wanted to look at, but if you look at Houston, again, it's, it's, a, it's a sector kind of story, right? We're talking about oil and gas. And as we go through periods, and this was a long period of time where we were looking at the value creation over a 50 year time period, that you go through period cycles, right? You go through period, you go through cycles. And as you go through booms and busts of oil, um, oil prices, you would see, you know, greater value creation in places like Houston. And when we're starting to see prices of oil come back to normal, you see that value creation, you know, somewhat dissipate. And so they're uh, an average slightly below where we were in Chicago. So hopefully, hopefully that answers that question. Definitely, thank you. Um, and we just have about two minutes left, so we'll okay. make the last question, of course, and be mindful of your time and everybody on our call today. Um, this person asks, do you think that since so many companies have seen success with work from home solutions during the pandemic, we may see more outsourcing internationally, potentially to countries like India or um, or others? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question too. So, um, you know, I'm gonna answer that question uh, by posing the, the question slightly different, right? Which is, do in our previous history, right? In the history of the US, we saw industrialization being a big part of agglomerations and economic output. Do we expect US cities to become more manufacturing oriented going forward? And then the answer is no, right? So I don't expect cities to be becoming more manufacturing oriented so we'll still, you know, you know, we'll still see, even though there, we in the pandemic we saw some supply disruptions take place. I, I still believe that you know knowledge base is the driving force for economic growth in the U.S. and not manufacturing base, right? And I'll you know I'll stop there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we can wrap it up for today then, but thank you again so much. Like I said, I know I certainly learned a ton. I hope everyone else who joined <laughs> us on the call today. Thanks did. everybody. Yeah. Um, and yeah, everybody have a great afternoon. Um, for thank, sure. you yeah. and thank you. Hopefully we will see you at some future events. Thank you.